Hi everyone, this is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Today, our special guest comes to us from Shanghai. He is Dan Collins from the China Money Report. The China Money Report is an investment publication for people interested in Chinese equities traded in Hong Kong, mainland China, or in the United States. They also cover regional emerging markets in Asia, such as Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and others. And they publish monthly, which consists of a 15 to 20 page premium content report about many issues related to China. Uh, Dan Collins is also the founder of Tiger Hill Capital Management, and that's a Hong Kong-based asset management company and corporate advisory company, and they are value investors who focus on fundamentals of companies and markets. Uh, more about Dan Collins' background is Dan has lived in China for 15 years. He has 15 years' experience as a private investor in mainland China, and he reads Mandarin Chinese fluently and has a background in engineering and manufacturing with multinational companies in China. He currently advises some of the world's largest hedge funds on China-related companies. Dan has also contributed to publications such as Financial Sense, the China Business Herald, and the Kaiser Report. Welcome to the Wall Street for Main Street podcast, Dan Collins. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Mo. It's good to be here. Uh, thanks for coming, Dan. Uh, the first topic I would like to discuss here is the gold and silver market. Now, the gold and silver market is in a, in a bull market, as you know. And what's different from this bull market than the one back in the 70s is the global demand, especially coming from China. Um, up until a couple of years ago, China was not allowed to own gold and silver. Now the government is, is encouraging them to own it. And I just wanted to ask you, what impact has China has on the investment demand for gold and silver and how they influence the, the price of gold and silver? Yeah, thanks, Mo. Um, generally, I say that China has had a massive influence uh, on gold, and not even gold, but just general in, on commodities in general. You know, to, today China uh, buys 50% of the world's copper, 50% of the world's oil, uh, sorry, 50% of the uh, world's uh, iron ore, uh, 50% of the world's zinc. So, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, there's been, last 10 years especially, massive commodity demand in, in China. And with regarding to gold, as, as I think most of your listeners know, China is also the world's largest gold producer now, passing South Africa several years ago. But in addition to into taking all of this uh, newly produced gold off the market, they're also a major gold importer. Uh, there's been a, uh, um, a directed plan out of China for the last four or five years to get uh, the Chinese people into gold. So there's a, there's a big push in retail markets here in gold. You can buy gold physically at the big four Chinese commercial banks. Uh, you can uh, own paper gold in your account. You don't even need to, to hold renminbi currency in paper. You can hold your, your cash account in gold. So there's a, uh, China, I think, has uh, been a major reason why gold shot up the last 10 years, and it will continue to buy uh, gold for the foreseeable future. Now, Dan, do you, do you think that the Chinese government is actively trying to encourage its citizens and go out of their way to encourage the citizens to buy and hold physical precious metals because they realize that the, you know, the currency wars and the paper money fiat inflation is, uh, is going to hurt their purchasing power and their other uh, you know, costs of living? Yeah, I, I believe there is a plan there. Uh, I think China had a, has a plan to hold gold in two ways. One is – well, really, you could say three ways. One is their own gold deposits, uh, their own gold miners, which are now going all over the world actively buying up deposits. Uh, there was recent news about a, a major $1 billion purchase in Brazil uh, from a Chinese gold miner. Uh, the second way would be, uh, you know, the central banks buying their own domestic gold and importing gold. And then the third way would be is what we just talked about was is uh, encouraging local Chinese here to own gold. And uh, that about started about three, four years ago and just came out of nowhere where every day you're reading about gold, gold, gold in, in the Chinese press, in the financial publications, uh, to the point where uh, I wouldn't say it's totally mainstream now, but it's not uncommon. Um, just a few weeks ago, a guy went in, into a gold store in Shenyang and bought $1 million in gold, physical gold, on the spot. Um, so you're seeing these kind of articles in the Chinese press. Uh, every couple of weeks, so and so bought a million dollars of this. So and so bought a million dollars of this, you know, silver or gold. And uh, it's um, yeah, there's increasing demand 
uh, in uh, retail and jewelry in China. So Chinese jewelry demand, gold jewelry demand is expected to double in the next five years. And I think it's already number two now behind India in terms of gold jewelry. Uh, you, you just talked about the gold market. What about the silver market? Um, are th- they used to be a net exporter of silver. Now they're importing silver now. Are they yeah. impor- importing silver because of the rising industrial demand? Because they're going to need a lot of silver to build out their solar in- uh, energy industry. Yep. Um, or are they using it to for investment demands as well? Yep. I, I think they're using it both in, uh, for both purposes. Uh, China used to, as you as you mentioned, China used to export roughly 3,500 tons of silver a year, and that was only about uh, four years ago. Uh, last year, they imported 3,500 tons of silver. Um, there, there's uh, talking about the retail, how people can hold bank accounts in gold and money, and you can buy physical gold. This starting this year, August 2010, uh, the four major Chinese commercial banks have also started carrying silver. So you can now also hold your cash account in silver at the four major Chinese banks. Um, this is a this is a really big deal for the silver market because uh, in addition to physical silver, they're selling paper silver. Okay, there was one bank, uh, the um, ABC uh, Agricultural Commercial Bank of China. And in particular, the ICBC, so the Industrial Commercial Bank of China, they just announced that in the last uh, almost last 12 months, uh, I calculated they've sold roughly 2% of all the silver mined in the world this year. So, and that, that's on paper. So, and these are new uh, private wealth management investment products, silver and gold in China. So, you're going to continue to see these things uh, increase massively every year here in yeah. China. Yeah, and I mean, the Chinese also have a long-term history with silver, too, because wasn't China on the silver standard prior to um, World War II, right? Yeah, Chinese, uh, historically, Chinese have used silver as the currency. So you look back 2,000 years, they've used silver. They've used what's called a silver tail. It's uh, kind of a, almost like a raindrop shape. Uh, I don't know if it was an ounce of silver or what the exact weight was. I don't remember. But, yeah, they have a 2,000-year history of using silver. And believe it or not, what would happen was the emperors in each dynasty would uh, um, de- uh, decontent the amount of silver in the coinage and then would eventually go to paper. And then that would uh, last for 20, 30, 40 years. And then it would be a massive financial chaos and they'd have to go back to silver. So not unlike what we're experiencing right now. <laughs> and uh, I believe the, the word bank in China actually means silver house. Is that true? That's correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, about the uh, the shiny demand for gold and silver, every time there's a dip, as uh, you told me before this interview, they're the one that actually come in on buying on the dip. So it's China that's actually putting a floor on the prices in gold and silver. Yeah, absolutely. I call it the China put. I mean, any anybody <laughs> investing in gold and silver, uh, you have to remember there's 1.3 billion uh, newly wealthy Chinese behind you buying these materials. So when we saw the gold price reach all-time highs, it was roughly 1923 or so, and then it goes back down very quickly, around 1550s or so. Within a few weeks after it dipped down to that level, it was reported Hong Kong uh, imported, not just Hong Kong. Hong Kong is the conduit. Mainland China buys through Hong Kong a lot of times. They imported something like 400 tons of gold within eight months. It was a four or 500% increase from last year. So absolutely, I think China, and China's not the only country, obviously, but a lot of these countries, central banks, are, you know, have plans to buy on the dips for gold. Yeah, and that's because, Dan, they have capital, uh, capital accumulation. You know, the, the, there's a humongous global wealth transfer going on right now from west back east. And the people there, you know, in the east, especially China, have learned to do more with less for a long time. And they've had to, you know, they didn't have a government social safety net, and they've had to have a savings base to build from. Absolutely. Um, you know, they know struggle. So in most Asian countries, you took, look at the uh, Chinese population today, people in their 50s, they have experienced hunger. So that's, uh, that gives you a totally different mindset. Uh, and that's why China has, has just so hungry and, and, and so driven right now to succeed. Um, you talk about the wealth transfer from west to east. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've been in, as you guys mentioned, I've been in China 15 years. 
So I, in a way, I'm kind of a, the frog that escaped the boiling pot. I go back to the U.S. and it just shocks me the changes I see, you know, year after year. Uh, in many ways, you know, I'm originally from the Detroit area, and you know, if you compare Detroit to modern day Shanghai, it's almost laughable. You know, the difference in, in, in wealth. Most of our airports, our infrastructure is really becoming third world now. So you go anywhere in Asia, the airports are new, the bridges are new, the roads are new, the buildings are all new. Uh, you know, they're opening factories, they're opening businesses. It's a totally uh, capitalist economy here in China. People people don't realize that. Um, they believe it's some kind of a government state directed, and they try to keep their hands on the. Uh, I could go back a little in time and, and tell the listeners how this developed. Basically, China in the 80s, were, coming out of the 60s and 70s, were starving, and they gave up. They said, we don't know what we're doing. We can't run the economy. And they went totally free market, like, on day one. So they kept the banks under control. They kept some of their state-owned enterprises. But they even told the army, you guys have to go out and make money yourselves because we have no money to give you. And that's why a Chinese military are huge investors today all over the world. They have huge companies. Uh, not a lot of people know Ford's car a vehicle manufacturing partner here is a Chinese weapons manufacturer. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's um, what happened is they went to private enterprise. And even today, you look at if you don't work, you don't eat. There's no social safety net. If you have a health problem, you pay for it or you don't get health care. There are no property taxes. Uh, the, the, the income tax is set at such a high level that only about 2 to 3 percent of the Chinese population pay income tax. So it's a it's, yeah. it's really a, a kind of a Ayn Rand type economy, and that's why they've grown so fast over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And most people who are not students of history, Dan, also forget the fact that the Chinese have thousands of years of entrepreneurial spirit. They've invented, you know, ice cream. I believe they've invented fireworks, gunpowder. You know, the list can go on and on of all the impressive innovations that have come out of China and the Chinese people for a long time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's been proven time and time again, governments versus liberty. If governments just get out of the way, the people will, will take care of everything. You know, take a look at I like to reference the Koreas. OK, you have basically the same North Korea, South Korea. You have the same ethnic group. You have the same language. They're in the same area. And you go to the South Korean side, you have some of the most advanced cities in the world building the latest, highest tech products, advanced transportation, sub, you know, metro lines, uh, everything running perfectly on schedule. And then you go 40 minutes over to the north and they don't have running water or running electricity. And they're a 100 percent command government economy. You know, the, the, we've run these, you know, we've run, you know, government control versus liberty in the human test lab on earth for 50 years, 100 years or longer, we know it works, you know, we, we, and we, we, it, things won't improve in the United States till we go, till we go back to that. Uh, great point. And a couple of years ago, I wrote in my blog an article how China is, is more of a capitalistic country than the U.S. I got a f few angry uh, feedback from that, but, but one, of the, <laughs> one, one of the reasons why is because the so uh, if you start a business in China, they won't tax you for the first three years. And then after that, I believe, as you told me, they'll, they'll tax you only 7% for the next three years. And then after that, only 15%. This is something that we don't have in this country because when you start a business, they automatically tax you 30% of whatever profit you make. Yeah, I mean, uh, taxes in general in Asia are very, very low. I mean, uh, and that's why Asia, that's why all the wealth is being transferred to Asia, you know, you People in Taiwan or another country, they would laugh at you. 30% tax, I'm not paying that. You know, they, they, they go, they're outraged about 15%. <laughs> so China has uh, learned, has a much better, more efficient tax system than the United States. And that's not hard to do. If you look at the United States, we have a tax code that's the size of the Bible. It's completely run for special interest and for tax lawyers. And it basically they don't collect tax, but yet they have these crazy high rates, but they're not actually collecting it. Nobody's actually, you know, you know, the, the big tech companies are not located in the United States. They're located in Holland, you know, on paper. Uh, but um, in China, what they've done is they've moved the tax code where they collect them. They, they tax imports, basically. So the average import here is still 20 percent tax. <clears throat> and then they have a VAT, a 70, 17 percent VAT. But what you do when you have a VAT is you're taxing other people's imports as well. 
and then you're taxing it 20% at the border. So they use that money to basically fund the government. And then you're not taxing productivity, you're taxing imports. The United States, the more you work, the more you pay. We, we, we tax productivity, but yet we, we, we let everybody else import to us at 0%, and then everyone else blocks our goods. So that's one of the main root causes behind the problems the United States is seeing right now. Yeah, Dan, and the U.S. also creates this larger welfare state, and it also subsidizes, you know, consumption heavily, which is just, you know, I think the government in the United States has got it backwards. Oh, absolutely. I think well, one of my new concepts I'm going to try to write about is what I call the American GDP bubble. So you look around at American GDP, it's like roughly 14 or 15 trillion, and China's is only six six trillion. Okay, but then you look back and you ask yourself, okay. What about vehicle production? China this year will make 19 million vehicles. The United States will make 11.5 million vehicles. Okay. China, the United States will produce 56 million tons of steel. China will produce 568 million tons of steel. Ten times the amount of steel the United States will produce. The United States will produce less steel this year than they produced in 1920. So, we look at this GDP number and we print this money and go into debt and leverage and we spend 1.6 trillion in deficits to get a 1% growth. And all of these talk, you know, academic ivory tower academics are all focused on this GDP number, GDP number, but there's no qualitative analysis behind the qualitative behind these quantitative numbers of 1% GDP growth. And I believe at some point when the final reckoning happens and the dollar goes down, the American GDP will collapse by half, at least, because it's all smoke yeah. and mirrors. Yeah, Dan, and unfortunately, like, to add to your points there, the U.S. GDP, over 70% of it is also fraudulent, because over 70% of U.S. GDP is also made up of government spending and consumer spending, and that's not productive. That doesn't help with our trade deficit. Absolutely. That doesn't make the country richer. Absolutely. It's, it's just like if I went out to Walmart today and spent $100 and said, hey, I just earned $100. <laughs> you know, you can't. And, you can't count your consumption as, as productivity. It's, it's insane. Yeah, it, exactly. And that's the problem with, you know, Keynesian economics in general is Keynesian economics says that, you know, dig a ditch, fill it back up, dig a ditch, fill it back up, broken window economics, and that this type of stuff is productive and makes society better. It doesn't. It doesn't, no. And the problem is, you know, honestly, I know you guys have Austrian backgrounds. I also follow Austrian school. And when I first was introduced, introduced to Austrian school, I said, wow, finally some guys that get it. You know, um, you know these guys, the Keynesians, will argue World, uh, World War II was a good thing. It got us out of, out of a depression. Well, it's a, to- it's a total fabrication. So we were late in World War II, going three, four years before everybody else did. We were selling all of our materials to Europe so they could fight, fight a war against each other. That's what got us out of the depression. And, you know, World War II, we went through rationing of food, sugar, coffee. I mean, is that prosperity? That's not, that's not really economic growth. I mean, it's, uh, and that goes back to the GDP number. Yeah, you could create a huge war and, and get a few percent GDP, but there's no qualitative aspect behind it. It's not the kind of, you know, country anybody wants to live in. Yeah, those are good points, Dan. And in my opinion, um, the reason we got, uh, you know, recovered after World War II was because the U.S. Uh, population had had a large savings base that during the Great Depression, you know, and during the war, people started to build savings because, you know, there was so much uncertainty and they didn't know what else to do. And, you know, when they came back home from the war, they had a savings base and that's when they started uh, spending. Sure, absolutely. And we didn't print money like uh, crazy like we do today either. We sold war bonds, the same with England, and that helped the recovery because we didn't debase our currency as, bad, as badly as they, as they might have done. And I still go, the, go back to that today, you know, uh, like these Occupy Wall Street guys. A lot of times I don't think they understand what's caused their problem, but I recognize why they need to be out on the streets. And, uh, you, know, what, what, you know, what they don't get is, is what the problem, the main problem is all of this money printing. You know, when you, when you continuously m- print money, uh, you de- totally debase your currency and you send your factories over, overseas, and the whole economy becomes financialized. And yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah, that's why exactly done. General Electric became a bank with some old world industries attached. General Motors became a bank selling car loans and, and buying subprime mortgages with a car industry attached. So the, the entire, you know, we had about 40% of uh, S&P profits were financial based. 
So they've totally distorted the the economic system in the United States with this money. And they've destroyed and they've destroyed the real economy. You pointed out a great difference between the paper or financial economy with the capital markets and the underlying real economy. And that's the problem with Keynesian economics and some of the other policy decisions from the U.S. government is it's misallocated resource and capital uh, tremendously into unproductive things. Absolutely. Yep. yep. All right. I want to shift gears and talk about fiat currency, um, particularly the, the yuan or, um, in China. Um, mm-hmm. I, as they continue to stockpile commodities like silver, gold, oil, uh, for example, uh, the Chinese uh, put a bid in to buy out Jaguar mining in Brazil. They mm-hmm. also invested in the Chesapeake Energy in southern Texas. Um, are they doing this to prepare an attempt to become a reserve currency? Because once countries that usually have a lot of commodities like gold and silver and oil are usually the one that uh, become a reserve currency for the world. Is China going in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, as it far as it related as it relates to the rise of the RMB or making the RMB an international reserve currency, I think there's some correlation there. But the main reason is if you're China, you're sitting on, and I've wrote articles about this, sitting on 3.5 trillion dollars in foreign currency reserves, and what do you do with that money? I mean, that money could literally buy the stock market in the United States. I mean, you could buy, you name the company, they, they could take most of the, the, the stock market in the United States. So they're only, go, they're only what do they do with it? They would, the US, would the U.S. government allow that, though? That's another question, maybe. <laughs> but what scares me is they, they definitely wouldn't allow it. But what scares me is what happens when we really get into a mess financially. And, and, and then we'll be desperate for foreign investment. When nobody accepts the dollar and we're desperate for foreign investment, who knows what they'll do? You know, um, you, you look at when Russia collapsed, right? They just turned their economy over to the oligarchs. They had no choice. So, um, but yeah, they're going around the world. They're buying. Uh, China understands commodities. The people in the West, I think the smart people get it. But the reason why the Chinese get it more is because they're build. They have a huge real economy. Talked about 568 million tons of steel, right? Steel is is a major per- consumer of commodities, right? So they get this. They, they they get it. I mean, they've seen the commodities going up year after year over here. We've seen things like uh, pig iron, which is a you know produced out of iron ore. That's doubled in a few years, three four years. It's getting close back to its all time highs. Uh, so they they understand it, and that's why you know instead of buying more treasuries, they want to go out and buy more commodities wherever they can find them. And you think also that that's why China is storing a lot of copper in a warehouse is because China has decided as a policy decision that, you know, 10 years from now, at least, you know, we have this copper in a warehouse. It's not going to go to zero. We need the copper. Um, and if we hold, you know, trillions or or uh, hundreds of billions in treasury or a couple trillion in treasuries in 10 years, God knows how how much or zero these things could be worth. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you look at the increase of the money supply uh, out of the Federal Reserve. They can print dollars a lot faster than you can mine copper. And I think at the end of the day, that's the equation that they, that, that they run. So, so you think that that's how China's uh, thinking then in terms of its long-term uh, strategy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Chinese Central Bank has commented on this. They were furious when the United States did QE3. Uh, you know, they realize they're getting ripped off. It's just now they're caught in a dollar trap, and that's that's why eventually they're going to make the RMB a reserve currency globally, and that's going to be the end of the dollar. And um, and another uh, topic is in the U.S. they are accusing China of manipulating their currency, uh, which is hypocritical because the U.S. is manipulating their own currency as well. Yep. Um, what is China? Uh, attitude or reaction toward the U.S. government um, from that accusation? Yep. Well, um, from my point of view, China is obviously a currency manipulator. They have to go in the market every day and buy dollars and and sell renminbi. That's one of the main reasons they've accumulated $3.5 trillion. But let me go back a little bit, explain why China is so gung-ho, so to speak, on a uh, very stable currency. So you go back 10 years ago, and this is another kind of financialization of the economy problem that's happened in the West. When you try to run a real business and you're trying to buy raw materials and you're trying to export products and sell products, you have these currencies jumping, you know, 5% one way every month. 
over a few months and go up 20%, 30%, you completely wipe out the profits of your operation. So China, going back 10 years ago, fixed their currency to the dollar to make it a very stable currency so that manufacturers, exporters, and even importers don't have to worry about a currency fluctuating all the time. And, uh, you know, the only way to go against that is you have to hedge. It's like paying a tax to the financial system, right? And uh, which can be 2 to 3% sometimes. So that's the root where they started the fixed currency. Today they absolutely do manipulate it. Uh, they do want to make it stronger, but they want to do it very incrementally in steps because they don't like dislocation of the real economy. If, if China is so worried about inflation, and um, why don't they just unpeg the yuan from the dollar? If they do that, then the own standard of living would increase, and then people would start uh, uh, saving and spending on the stuff that they make. Right. I uh, I totally agree. That's what they should do. I've been a proponent. I've been arguing here, even in Chinese business publications, they need to increase the renminbi. So the only thing you're going to do by increasing the renminbi is you're going to raise local living standards here. Why why should Chinese continue to work for people in the West and collect paper IOUs that they'll never make good on? So you need to increase the living standards here. They want and they are increasing very fast. China wants a, a one billion middle people middle class in China by 2025, and they and they say that's based on about a twenty thousand dollar per year income, which would be okay here. And uh, I, I think they'll make that happen. But uh, part of that, they need to increase the renminbi. I think they'll you know, they'll be able to import more. What they have done is they have dislocated their economy slightly by holding the renminbi too low too long. So there's too much investment in fixed assets, too much focus on exporting. And you have, a, and then you have white collar workers who don't have jobs. So you have blue collar workers. You can't find workers in China. So most factories are running with about 20% less people than they actually would need or want. So you've got too much focus blue collar, not enough white collar. You've held down the service sector here in favor of the export sector. I think that's a flaw. And, and I think, you know, there's two camps in China. There's one camp that wants to increase the room maybe a lot faster. There's another camp that feels there's some kind of conspiracy theory. Why does the U.S. want us to increase it to make us uncompetitive? So so eventually, I think at the end of the day, China's smart. Yeah, and I, I think, Dan, uh, a lot of your point there about the conspiracy theory that the people in the Chinese Central Bank have is because the Chinese people see what happened to Japan uh, a couple decades ago, you know, when they revalued the yen. And then, you know, the things went crazy over there. The Japanese people were buying up the world. And then all of a sudden, the, their markets collapsed and their banking system collapsed. And, you know, the Chinese, I guess, are worried about not being the next Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, the conspiracy there is, okay, well, the, the, the Japanese, the, their, their currency, I would think, went up around 400% over several decades. And um, now look at the problems they have. There's another way to look at it is that in, in some, some areas of thought, Japan also say, one of our problems was we kept the Japanese yen too low for too long, and we created a cre huge credit bubble. And that's one area where China may step into that problem. But, uh, yeah, in general, you know, everybody's familiar with the, with the problems of Japan, um, you know, massive 200% debt-to-GDP ratios. But Japan, I, and they're in their favor, have kept the real economy going. You know, would you rather live in Detroit or would you rather live in Hiroshima? So if you look at uh, those two cities today, it's hard to see who won World War II. So, uh, yeah, China is at a turning point now. Um, I think the world's pressuring them. And it's not just the United States pressuring China to increase the renminbi. The whole world is pressuring China to increase the renminbi. Brazil can no longer manufacture. Uh, India, I mean, everybody's gotten their clock clean, basically, by Chinese manufacturing. Um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But instead of waiting for China to increase their currency, what they've done in these other countries like Brazil is they put on import duties. So uh, and basically they're just matching the import duties that China has against these other countries. So, you know, my suggestion to the United States is you need to think outside the box here and, and, and wake up and bring your real economy back online. You create a lot of jobs. And great point, Dan. And I want to um, now just start talking about the real estate in China. Um, I was watching various video clips of ghost town or cities in China where you have all these empty buildings and shopping centers in, in China. Now, how prominent are those in China? 
Yeah, the real well, the uh, there, there there's several cases of the so-called ghost towns. Uh, I wouldn't. Um, I think it's overstating it to say of a town. They're usually uh, areas, special areas of a city uh, that the government decides they're going to make a new development. And what they do on the new development is uh, a lot of people have the imagination that the government just builds a new town. In reality, what happens is the the private companies have built these office buildings, these condos, these these buildings. So these buildings have been uh, built, and most times they're sold. But what happens in China is they're built so fast. So they'll build an entire an area in, in China, you know, a new region, and they'll build it in 18 months. So new apartments, new schools, new hospitals, everything, and that will be in 18 months. So if you take satellite photos, yeah, it looks like an empty town. But if you wait six months, you wait a year goes by, it starts filling up, and two, three years later, uh, it's full. I personally experienced this in China. Um, I, you know, I have real estate in areas that uh, used to be ghost towns, and you would drive down a four-lane highway with nobody on it, and that was three, four years ago. Today, you have a traffic jam. So, um, with urbanization, you know, in China, it was massive urbanization in China. Um, you know, I don't see a major problem with properties, and I would say if you look at the at the Chinese real estate market as a whole, it 50% of the properties have been bought cash up front. The other 50% have at least 30% down. The Chinese government has to put in draconian rules to stop people from buying properties with cash. So I don't see that as a negative real on the real estate market. I think, could you see a small price decrease? Yeah, 10, 20% maybe next year. But there's so much equity now in homes, and there's so little outstanding credit and, and, you know, on these apartments that there's really no long-term problem uh, that I see with Chinese real estate. Now, do you think if the um, RMB was fully revalued with free market forces, do you think that this would basically be more of a non-issue? Do you think, like, basically all of the apartments would be filled then? Because I've seen videos, too, some of these interviews, where the Chinese people have said, you know, they live in an older town next to one of these newer uh, buildings, and they said, you know, we have savings, but our purchasing power is not enough. We don't have enough money to move in. Right, yeah. They're, um, the rent being convertible might, would, might help. Uh, one of the big drivers behind real estate in China is that there's not a lot of people for Chi- not a lot of places for Chinese to invest. So, you know, you have, you have cash. Now you have the gold and silver getting popular, and you have real estate. They largely stay out of the stock market because they don't trust it, and, and they shouldn't because it's, it's, there's a lot of problems with the, the Chinese A-share market. But, uh, um, yeah, so they, they buy a second home, a third home. I know people who own five or six apartments, and that's just looked upon as, a, um, as an investment, and they're not going to sell it. Uh, you know, They don't plan to sell it. They don't need to sell it. They've paid cash for them. So um, yeah, it's it's a strange, it's an interesting market. Yeah, that that's pretty interesting, Dan. Um, that you brought up that the Chinese don't trust their own stock markets there, because uh, I think a lot of our listeners would remember the problems with you know the Chinese reverse stock splits and some of the uh, I think it was China National Forest or China Forestry Group, yep. and some of those other companies. Uh, where the counting standards are not held, you know, in China to the same highs as in the U.S. Not that the U.S. highs are super high either, but, I mean, the Chinese ones are much lower. Yes, absolutely. Two years ago, major opportunity uh, to short Chinese companies in the United States. So my firm was busy doing that. Now the opportunity is the other way, though. If you know the real companies, there's massive opportunities out there. Some of these companies selling one, two times earnings, and they're real companies. And, you know, I know many of these companies. But the, the problem is, and it's really a twofold problem, the whole concept of the reverse takeover market in the United States is ridiculous. Why would you have a whole market where these companies can come in and get listed on exchange for as little as three or $400,000? And uh, the Chinese market in general, there is a lot of corruption. What's interesting is people don't understand is the accounting books look fine. They can get audited by KPMG or whoever, and they'll pass the audits. That's not the problem. The problem is the off-balance sheet items and the hidden inventories and the fact the customers that don't exist and uh, these type of things. So it was really an accident waiting to happen in the United States. You have some firms in the United States pitching these companies, getting paid consulting fees to pitch these companies, and then you had willing investors buying a China story. Wow, 
They sell environmental protection equipment, and they're in China. Great story. They buy it. Oh, this company is the Amazon of China. Well, what they don't know is there's 12 other Amazons of China. So there is a lot of, um, yeah, I would suggest for U.S. investors mostly to stay out of Chinese stocks uh, unless you really know what you're doing with Chinese stocks. Yeah, I tend to be in the Jim Rogers camp where the best way to invest in China, Dan, is still through uh, commodities, in my humble opinion. Yeah, commodities. You also have uh, some multinationals that have just blown the door off in China. You look at, like, Yum! with KFC. I mean, my God, there is a KFC on every corner. You can go out to little towns now and find KFCs. I mean, these guys are printing money. And they're not just busy at the lunch hour and the dinner. Hour. They are lined up at any hour of the day and night. So, I mean, these guys, you know, and they have, you know, low-cost labor, and they, you know, I mean, they're just printing money. Most foreign multinationals are printing money in China, and people don't realize that. They make a lot of money. So my, my whole background here for 15 years I started with was in multinationals, and, you know, we were making, you know, I worked for the world's largest car company for several years. And we, you know, they could make profits back then of 20%. Before so, it was government motors. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, maybe I was working for Toyota. No. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, yeah, no, they, uh, well, they're a GM, though, now they're a totally changed company. If I could comment a little bit on the car industry, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, people in the U.S., GM, first of all, is a great company. People need to get behind GM. They forget that, you know, GM won World War II. We were pumping out so many tanks and guns and airplanes out of Michigan that, you know, there was an old saying back in World War II. Uh, the German supplier for military supplier was the Krupp Presta family, which is still a steel supplier today. And they said for every grenade that Krupp Presta threw at the Americans, GM threw three back. So, I mean, GM has a long history in the United States. What the Americans need to ask themselves is why can't a car company in the United States be profitable? I mean, why in the world cannot one company survive? And the reason is unfair trade policy. The Japanese won't buy cars from Korea, let alone the United States. The Koreans won't buy car companies from Japan, let alone the United States. They have blocked their own markets, and they sell cars. You know, they, they amortize their costs in their home countries, and they sell below, you know, they sell the, uh, depreciated pricing in the United States, and they take out huge profits. Our own domestic automakers in the United States were saddled with decades of uh, workers. You have to remember General Motors at one time had a million people working for General Motors in the factories. These people were collecting retirement pensions. So there's no way when you allow uh, Japanese Korean car companies to come in, they block their own markets, they come in fresh new company, they don't pay union wage, they don't have any retirees, of course they're going to blow the doors off your, your domestic company. But, you know, you need some enlightened uh, policies to deal with these kind of issues in free trade in, in, in the world. Well, this is what happens, Dan, you know, from an Austrian perspective and a free market perspective when subsidies and tariffs are involved, that people can learn to cheat and game the system. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and yeah, look, you look at Korea. Korea, uh, they won't buy anybody else's cell phones, computers, televisions, ships. Everything in Korea is made in Korea, and and they've gamed the system, and they're one of the most wealthy countries in the world now, and it's worked for them. I want to um, get your outlook on the Chinese, Chinese economy for the next few years. I've seen uh, a lot of people say that China is due for a hard landing in their economy due to the so-called uh, real estate bubbles. Um, I've seen other people say that uh, they'll have a small uh, – correction in our economy. I want to get your outlook on the Chinese economy. What do you think is going to happen to China in the next few years? Sure. Well, um, I think, the, first of all, the, when people in the United States talk about the Chinese economy, they instantly assume that China is much more dependent on the United States than they actually are. So if you look at net exports this year, actually contributed 0% to the Chinese GDP. So there's a huge, we talked about the steel production numbers, 10 times the amount of steel the United States produces, twice as many cars. So the luxury goods, China's by far now the world's largest market for luxury goods. So the Chinese economy is massive. If you really revalued the GDP numbers and you counted it the same way, Chinese economy, in my opinion, would be already be much larger than the United States economy. 
So what we had last year is the economy is growing too fast. Okay, last year we were getting 11, 12 percent GDP numbers, and that was a lot of that was due to kind of the panic stimulus of '09 that the Chinese put into the market. You know, they just ramped up credit, you know, huge, huge numbers, led to inflation in 2010. Uh, inflation official numbers were 5.5 percent. In reality, people will tell you it was like 10 percent. You, you know, you saw all around Asia inflation just going crazy. And so what they did this year is they moved industrial loans from 5% to 9%. So for a Chinese enterprise today, your cost of capital is 9%. They've also increased the bank's reserve requirements 12 times. So anytime you do that, you're going to get a slowdown. China's obviously definitely slowed down, in especially in the last quarter. So what we'll see next year in China is still very positive. You still have a lot of young demographic here, 30-somethings. Their wages are increasing every day. So uh, wages this year will increase 20 to 30% for the average Chinese person. So there is a huge, still a huge real economy demand in China, which I think will not create a hard landing anytime in the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I have one final question, Dan, and then we'll wrap up the interview here. And it centers around uh, China, China's natural resource policy. In uh, The Art of War, Sun Tzu said that you can defeat your enemy without fighting. And I think the Chinese have uh, figured this out, that the best way to defeat their competition in business is to secure all the natural resources long term and be more forward thinking than the rest. Uh, do you think that's an accurate statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the Sun Tzu is a, is a great point because it, it is read by government officials here. Um, you know, a, a, another way to look at it, Henry Kissinger's book brought out the point of the Chinese game Wei Qi, kind of also known as Chinese chess. The, the object is not to uh, militarily attack your opponent directly, but the object is to surround your competitor on the board. So there's many, many pieces that are called stone, and um, your, the object is to encircle your opponent and really what where we're living in today is we're in economic competition but we haven't we haven't figured that out we're still running around the world with you know carrying a big military stick and uh con countries like china will, you know just keeps you know, tell us just ignore it go for it you know we're going to keep buying resources we're going to keep building the economy so um you know as an american my suggestion would be we need to look at foreign policy from an economic standpoint and we need to build the living standards of Americans. That's what uh, we need to focus on as, a, as opposed to uh, the military solutions. Yeah, and I think that's some really good points you just said, Dan, because, you know, you look at the U.S. and the U.S. is fighting in Afghanistan and China's in there mining copper, right? Exactly. And then, yeah, so obviously the priorities for both countries are completely different on, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum there. Although the U.S. has said that, like, they plan on eventually developing natural resources in Afghanistan in the next couple of decades. But, I mean, China's already there doing it way ahead of us. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, China has a, China has a machine in terms of extracting resources that we cannot hope to compete with. So what do I mean by that? You go to Africa today. They dominate economics in Africa because why? They can go and build a road. They can go build an electric wall and develop these markets and these developed economies, get the resources, and send them back to China. A great point, uh, Dan. Um, well, we'd like to wrap up this interview. Uh, before we uh, do, I let you go, why don't you tell our viewers <clears throat> about your newsletter and your um, your your firm? Sure. Our uh, newsletter can be found at the thechinamoneyreport.com. So uh, we have a monthly newsletter. We also have daily uh, uh, articles on China-related topics, what we see is important. A lot of that information comes directly out of the Chinese press into English. So it's a good place to kind of get firsthand information on what's going on in, on in China. And then my firm in Hong Kong is, is a asset management and corporate advisor called Tiger Hill Capital. It can be found at tigerhillcap.com. Okay, great. Well, Dan, thank you for coming on to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. I hope you come back in the future. We enjoy talking to you. Be glad to come back. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Jason.